So I am on my way to my ketamine therapy session. I feel like I've had some anxiety recently around work, around coronavirus and the uncertainty there. And looking forward to kind of taking a big step back, thinking about anxiety and how I can manage it and going with an open mind. The only thing I'm not looking forward to are the needles. I don't like needles. Welcome to Business Trip, where we dig into the most promising companies in psychedelics. I'm your host, Greg Kubin. In episode one, we're going to talk to Dylan Bynan, the founder and CEO of Mindbloom, which is a mental health and well being company. Mindbloom opened their first ketamine clinic in New York City in early 2020. Ketamine market today is growing really quickly, and I've had some investors who are like, Dylan, when you came to us, this seemed like a crazy idea. This is in like late 2018, early 2019, and now it like doesn't even seem that original. So it's definitely moving very quickly. But before we start the interview, I want to share why we're working on this podcast. So for thousands of years, psychedelics have been used in sacred rituals by indigenous cultures. But today, in Western culture, we're finding that psychedelic therapy can treat some of society's biggest mental health challenges. We're talking about depression, anxiety, PTSD, addiction, potentially even Alzheimer's. This has opened the door for a new crop of entrepreneurs that are building businesses ranging from biotech companies that are developing novel compounds to clinics and retreats for healing. And a psychedelic industry of passionate and thoughtful people is forming. But mixing psychedelics and capitalism is a delicate combination. I'm interested to know, how do you build a successful psychedelic company? And how will companies balance healing people, but also meeting investor returns? We'll explore these topics as I interview founders of psychedelic companies in each episode. Today's episode features Mindbloom, who's currently offering ketamine-assisted therapy to treat anxiety and depression. Ketamine historically has been used in medicine as an anesthetic. But more recently, the mental health community is finding it has two major therapeutic benefits. First, it's a disassociative when administered at a higher dose, which basically means that you temporarily lose your sense of self and your surroundings. And second, Ketamine creates new neural pathways in the brain and opens what's called the neuroplastic window that makes your thinking more malleable. So when combined with psychotherapy, where you're talking with a therapist, these conditions appear to be a really effective way to change your perspective, to overcome anxiety and depression. From a business model perspective, Mindbloom is a platform that services medical practices that are independently owned and operated and Mindbloom plans to leverage technology to bring the cost of their treatments down over time. Ah, and did I mention I participated in a ketamine treatment at Mindbloom? I'll share my firsthand experience throughout the episode, so stay tuned for that. And now, to the interview with Dylan Bynan, the founder of Mindbloom. So yeah, why don't we get into the actual business of Mindbloom? We'd love to know the first year in business, like how did you put this thing together? How did this come to be? Yeah, I have a lot of family that's just riddled with really serious mental illness. I lost my mother to acute uh, addiction, schizophrenia uh, growing up. And I knew that what we're seeing is the destigmatization of mental health care, but we're still really in like the first or second inning when it comes to it, right? Mm -hmm. Talk therapies recently become destigmatized. Uh, yoga and meditation are exploding in popularity. We're beginning to really push this conversation of well, how do we live in the wealthiest, most progressive society that's ever existed, the freest society, but we still have major, major issues societally and people are deeply unhappy. Something has to change here. Uh, and so I want to tackle that problem. And I, I kept coming back to psychedelic medicine as the thing that was most impactful for me and my emotional and psychological and just emotional well-being development over the past 10 years. And the thing that I thought was sort of already here, just not evenly distributed, mm -hmm. the thing that people would be doing in the future, especially as I had been following for the last 
several years, all the incredible work that MAPS and these other trailblazers have done to really help bring these things um, to the public in a smart, safe, legal, effective way to help people access them. Um, so as I was thinking about this, I was actually at lunch with my personalized medicine doctor here in New York, who's a close friend of mine, and was telling him this, and he blew my mind when even though I had been um, um, like donating and following map, maps for a while and had been, you know, really thought that I was like at the forefront of understanding what was going on in psychedelic therapy. He blew my mind when he told me that he had been working with ketamine therapy in his practice and that there were these um, growing sort of cottage industry of ketamine clinics who were helping people with depression and mood disorders using ketamine. Um, so like I said, I've been suffering from some anxiety and I became a patient myself and my first experience with it was just as profound as other experiences I've had. And I thought, wow, here's a psychedelic medicine that's available today that could help a lot of people, but it's not that approachable, scary, unknown, um, you know, in some ways has a bad reputation. It's really expensive. Ketamine therapy is like 600 to $1,200 a session on average. Um, and the experience, uh, based on what I've seen and from heard from other, other patients, um, and clients is generally very, very clinical. Um, so here's an opportunity to, uh, bring a, a real, um, sort of inspired hospitality mindset to elevating the experience and using technology to increasing access. Um, so that was the genesis of the idea. And the next step is, okay, um, are there clinicians out there to partner with who um, you know, would actually do the treatment, design the protocols, who I could help support with the work I know how to do as a tech entrepreneur to help them do their work in the world, which is the real work, right? So I had my first ketamine treatment at Mindbloom three days ago, and it was powerful. It allowed me to explore my anxiety in a safe space. But it also kind of felt like a fleeting dream where I had these memories and emotions and thoughts kind of rush to my head. And so I know that you've talked about utilizing ketamine therapy in your own experience. So I'd love mm -hmm. to know, you know, what your own experience has been like with the medicine. Hmm. And my experiences have been really profound. Uh, I've been using a psychedelic medicine for about a decade, and it's been one of the most transformational uh, practices that I've had in my emotional and psychological uh, and like ontological development over that time period. When I first experienced ketamine, uh, maybe similar to what you just said, I had it just as profound of experiences I've had on a range of other serotonergenic psychedelic medicines. Uh, to your point about the fleeting ephemeral uh, feelings and, and some of the memories, um, Ketamine does act on your glutamate system, uh, which largely regulates your memory. Let me break this down for you. Many psychedelics, like LSD and psilocybin, primarily act upon serotonin, a neurotransmitter that contributes to feelings of well-being and happiness. Ketamine primarily modifies the activity of glutamate, a different neurotransmitter in the brain, which makes neurons more active and more likely to form new connections. And so it can feel oftentimes very dreamlike. Uh, one of the things that we do at Mindbloom and that I do personally, uh, which is you know a hallmark of a lot of psychedelic therapy protocols and best practices, what people have been doing for a long time is journal. And I think in particular with ketamine, uh, more so maybe than any other psychedelic medicine because of those sort of fleeting feelings and memories, journaling right after uh, really helps solidify those memories um, uh, and sort of store them from like working memory to long-term memory. Uh, it's sort of like a dream journal. So I don't know if you've ever kept a dream journal. I hadn't until I uh, um, had done ketamine therapy and started journaling afterwards. Uh, it really helps like solidify those memories and gives them, gives people something to like grab onto. It's almost like you have all these threads and it coalesces into an actual ball of yarn that you can then unpack later. Let's talk about ketamine as a way to address anxiety and depression. Can you share, you know, what it does to the brain and and why ketamine therapy is effective? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first and foremost, I want to make clear that I'm not a clinician or a doctor or psychiatrist um, or anything more than an amateur hobby, uh, hobbyist scientist and don't want anyone to think I am. Um, but I am a tech entrepreneur and a ketamine patient myself, um, so I can tell you what I do know about the neuroscience. 
ketamine upregulates it's called brain derived neurotrophic factor bdnf uh, this is a protein similar to like um, that has similar effects to say like hgh human growth hormone but in the brain so it induces synaptogenesis this is the uh, creation of new synapses or connections in the brain if you didn't catch that bdnf stands for brain derived neurotrophic factor and is protein that grows new neurons and synapses in the brain. It's basically miracle grow for your brain, as psychiatrist John Rady put it. Exercise, meditation, and deep sleep all increase BDNF. So do psychedelics. Fundamentally, uh, as people have these ruminative neural pathways, whether that's depression or addiction um, or anxiety, that gets built and reinforced over time, um, you know, sort of like um, I think of an analogy that our medical director, Dr. Casey Palios, talks about is uh, s- like snow from skiers, like in in a, in a snowbank. Um, when BDNF is upregulated, uh, it allows the brain to form new, healthier neural pathways and connections. So um, one of the things that's really fascinating is uh, the medical literature shows that if you give somebody ketamine in a completely clinical setting with even no psychedelic medicine container or therapy around it, you just essentially inject them with ketamine, uh, there are still pretty significant improvements to people. It's like 70 to 80% of people have marked improvements in their symptoms uh, just because the upregulation of BDNF will kick them out of these neural pathways and they'll help them form healthier ones. Uh, probably in like a three to 14 day a window of neuroplasticity after each session. Uh, and so when you give people that medicine in a container where you're actually helping them make sense of and interpret those experiences and go in with intentions and work on them um, and then create a plan to integrate those experiences, leveraging that neuroplastic state where their brain is creating new connections, um, really helping them uh, get out of those ruminant pathways and then build healthier new ones that stick and last. So is there a target number of sessions that a patient you know, is going through with MindBloom? Yeah, so, so MindBloom's a, uh, right now, the clinician's protocol is a four session program, um, generally every one to two weeks for an initial program. And if somebody does a one of the subsequent programs, um, then that it could be over every like two to four weeks per session. A big reason that it's four sessions other than that's backed by the medical literature, about four to six sessions, um, is that it's helping people really leverage this three to 14 day neuroplastic window where they're able to um, more readily build synaptic connections um, and, uh, and and build new neural pathways. Uh, so with MindBloom's programs, every session sort of builds on the last uh, and, and is accretive you know, throughout this like four session program. Greg here. I'd like to share a bit about my ketamine therapy experience at MindBloom. Here's how it went down. First, I had to qualify for treatment. So I filled out a questionnaire on their website and had a 30-minute video consultation over Zoom with a MindBloom practitioner. I shared the anxiety that I've been experiencing lately, which honestly has been heightened by the onset of coronavirus. I was approved for treatment and scheduled my ketamine session for a few days later. I was also told to set an intention for the session. My intention was about feeling more comfortable when I'm not fully in control and surrendering to the world around me. On the day of my treatment, I arrived at their nomad office on an empty stomach. After a brief conversation with the clinician, I was moved to the treatment room. The setting was super chill. I sat in a zero gravity chair, which tilts back, so I felt like I was floating. I was covered in a weighted blanket and I put on an eye mask and headphones. The clinician then administered the dose through an intramuscular shot in my left arm, which was a pretty painless prick. The first three minutes felt like a rocket ship lift off. It was a bit intense, as my heart pounded and lots of thoughts and feelings raced through my head. But I breathed deeply through it and listened to a seven-minute recording by Sam Harris, the neuroscientist and philosopher, about the meaning of life. The audio then changed to this ethereal track, like, "Ah, ah, ah, ah." Here are some of the things I experienced. I felt calm, at peace with myself and the world around me. I considered big life choices, 
like if and when I want to have kids. I felt a sense of unity and had this vision of people working in psychedelics all working together. I felt creative and I visualized a giant brain covered in picket signs that were labeled with important life to-dos, like doing my taxes. I also felt trippy. At one point, I felt like a giant block of cheese. The journey took an hour, and afterwards, I was escorted to the integration room and journaled about my experience. So I just finished my session, and I'm in the integration room, feeling really calm, kind of blissed out writing down my reflections in my journal, which I want to make sure I capture because a lot of these memories can be fleeting. It was a really powerful experience. I retrieved memories. I thought about some things that I think have been giving me some sense of anxiety. I also... I'm left thinking about how do I re-enter the world calmly? And the best answer that I have right now is to be present. Don't think in the future about what could be and things that can go wrong. Don't think about the past, about decisions that I made that I may regret. Just be. There are other psychedelics that can be used also to address some of these issues, things like anxiety and depression, such as LSD Mm -hmm. or psilocybin. When do you use ketamine versus those other medicines or substances? Ketamine is the only uh, prescribable uh, psychedelic medicine available today. Um, So I've had my life utterly transformed, starting with uh, MDMA therapy uh, about a decade ago, June of 2009. And I've had really powerful experiences with other psychedelic medicines and I'm super excited for the day when these medicines become available to more people. Uh, and I think we're even, ex- I'm even excited personally for when these medicines um, are available as an elective medicine, hopefully one day in the future, not just for people really suffering or battling mood disorders like anxiety or depression or PTSD. Um, but right now, ketamine is legal, prescribable here and available to people. Ketamine is a Schedule Three substance, which makes it the only psychedelic that can be legally prescribed in the United States today. Meanwhile, LSD, psilocybin mushrooms, and MDMA are Schedule One substances, which means they are not prescribable, since the DEA defines them as having no medical use and as highly addictive. But this could all change in the next few years as the Food and Drug Administration has given a handful of psychedelic-assisted treatments breakthrough therapy status, which expedites their review process. The space initially was a space that you rented out, like a temporary space, and now you're building a more dedicated one. So it was the idea to kind of test out your hypotheses in this temporary space and make sure you know what you're building towards and use it as like a testing ground? This first space is in a sort of medical uh, co-working space. Uh, where we've um, you know taken out several rooms and and you know really hand designed to create like an elevated experience with like signature touch points throughout the process. It sort of feels like a hospitality experience, uh, and are currently designing a four thousand square foot uh, state of the art flagship space. We're going to be launching later this year. So you've raised a bit of money so far. Mm-hmm. And what's your plan there? You're going to go raise venture and go beyond just this one space? So our first space is already profitable on the space, uh, growing uh, you know, very quickly, almost more quickly than we can and the clinicians can handle at this point. Uh, so we're both you know, expanding to a much larger space that will allow us to create a much more elevated experience for clients here in New York um, and, and do some other really special things that the team's excited about. Uh, as well as to begin expanding into uh, other states. The existing ketamine therapy, or at least historically, costs $600, upwards of Mm $1,000. Right now, MindBloom is about $250 a session. How are you able to bring those costs down? Yeah, so there's a couple ways. Um, One is we we have a technology platform 
um, you know, I'm a tech entrepreneur and, uh, I think that, I don't know if you saw the recent, um, um, uh, Bill Gates documentary on Netflix, but he mentions that, you know, everything, he's a hammer and everything looks like a nail to him. And that's how do we solve this with technology? And so that's definitely a big component of what we're doing is building software. Uh, we have a platform now that helps streamline a lot of the process and adds elements of telemedicine and teletherapy to the platform, uh, which helps bring down costs. After the COVID-19 pandemic hit the U.S., MindBloom has been able to provide virtual ketamine sessions because rules around teletherapy have temporarily changed. This means that ketamine in pill form is delivered to patients to take at home, and they still get the support from a clinician both before and after the experience. It remains to be determined if regulators will permit this delivery model after the pandemic. What has your experience been like pitching investors? Um, <laughs> so it's been pretty easy so far, but I, I think as we as we grow, it's going to probably become more challenging. Um, I'm lucky that I had um, some friends and, and previous investors in my last company who were really passionate about their psychedelic medicine experiences and how transformational they've been in their life um, that sort of seeded the company. Uh, and then a couple uh, VC funds sort of piled in. So I raised the first round um, without you know, a pitch deck or, or sort of, um, any like real process. Um, but, uh, I can, you know, I can, I can give you more information on that in like six months. <laughs> okay. In process now. Uh, yeah, we're going to be raising another round to, to fund expansion soon. How big is this market? I think of the market is how many people today, at least if you look at what the clinicians are serving today, have depression or anxiety. Okay. Um, and or how many people are going to therapy and have these symptoms of depression or anxiety, even if they're not yet diagnosed, but have those symptoms and could be diagnosed. Um, how big is the market for like mental well-being? Um, <laughs> so the Kemi market today, I think it's um, I think there's been trouble gathering data on it. Um, it's growing really quickly. And even if you just like follow the press since like the launch of this company, uh, it's astounding. I've had some investors who are like, Dylan, when you came to us, this seemed like a crazy idea. This is in like late 2018, early 2019. And now it like doesn't even seem that original. Um, so it's definitely moving very quickly. Um, but I think in order to actually create and grow the market, uh, it's a focus on how do you make these medicines approachable so that they're not scary and intimidating? Uh, ketamine is a pretty gentle experience. Um, and it's something that, you know, there haven't, hasn't been like a single adverse event or even like negative experience in the space to date, uh, as well as, you know, increasing access by making it more affordable. I mean, if, if it's a thousand dollars a session, which I think even like a few years ago, like is probably close to what the average was, um, even though the price is coming down over time, you know, that puts it out of reach for a lot of people who would need it. So will there be a point where this will be accessible to people, you know, whether it's through insurance or just at a low enough price point? Yeah, I mean, we think so. One of the ways that we're trying to push that forward is by collecting a lot of outcomes data on how do people's symptoms of depression or anxiety, as well as measures of like meaning and purpose and connection, uh, which are like official measures and scales from the National Institute of Mental Health, how do they track over time? And so every day there's more like research, there's more data, there are more client stories and more like actual outcomes data demonstrating that this is uh, helping people achieve like long lasting relief. Uh, and that is how we can help get insurance and uh, employers to pick this up and cover it, which would really help to continue driving down the cost for people. What keeps you up at night? What keeps us up at night is is the idea of like a patient or clients having a really adverse outcome. So we are like really excessive about you know client safety. Um, and you know as as an entrepreneur, sometimes that can feel um, tough. You know, my last company was in fintech. And so like, I thought I understood like regulation and like the burden or the challenge of, you know, having to sort of go slow to go fast and be really thoughtful. But healthcare is a whole different animal. And, you know, we just talk about putting clients first, you know, all, like all day up, up and down. Um, so that's definitely the thing that worries us most. I don't know if it worries us, but that's the thing that keeps me up at night. Does ketamine have addictive properties? So... There haven't been instances 
uh, that we've been able to find uh, people de developing a dependency on ketamine in a clinical environment. Um, and oftentimes, uh, we'll even have clients because everyone goes through like informed consent process where they read about this and they come out of it saying, how could you get addicted to this? This is like something I'd want to use as a, as a tool or medicine, but not something I'd necessarily want to do all the time. Um, so most cases or potentially all cases of addiction that have been, or dependency that, um, have occurred are usually people who have like unfettered access to the medicine. So, um, you know, people on the black market, um, potentially a hospital or veterinary workers who have access to, you know, medical grade pharmaceutical ketamine and already have other addiction issues going on. Um, but part of our technology platform is, um, which I think you probably have used now, um, monitoring and people's uh, potential for side effects and dependency development throughout the process. So the, um, the clinicians are getting information, can jump in front of that if something like that ever happened. What skills do you see needed in this space? What, Thoughtful, what are, thoughtfulness. Thoughtfulness, okay. Th thoughtfulness. Um, yeah, it's, I think, I know when I got started getting into the space, um, um, there were definitely people in the space who were an express like nervousness of, um, you know, founders or people who haven't spent their careers in academia or science or research, you know, coming in and, and starting to, you know, build things around this space. And that's something I always like totally understood because I'm like also nervous about it, not just someone in it, but I care so much about the cause has been such a huge part of my life that uh, if something were to set the cause back, uh, that would be cataclysmic. Um, and because I, you know, like you, I know how powerful these medicines can be to help millions and millions of people like really alleviate their suffering and help really create a better world through them. Um, so I think anybody who comes into this space, both because of just the space and how sort of fragile it is and how early it is, as well as that it's healthcare and healthcare really is a whole different animal. Um, that a lot of extreme thoughtfulness of how to approach it and how to interact with the people in the space uh, is is really necessary. Your focus right now is really medicinal, right? But within the psychedelic world, there are kind of a lot of subcultures and groups and sort of an underground community that exists. Do you interact with those communities? Are you just staying in your lane? You know, there's organizations like MAPS, there's nonprofits. Like, where do you, where do you see yourself fitting into the landscape? We just try, really try to stay like laser focused on how do we help our clinicians and how do we help create technology and design and content to help the clients? Um, I mean, we do spend time with other people in the community, but I, I guess we don't really think a ton about how we plug into the greater community other than um, making sure that the approach and how we're speaking about it is something that people who have been doing this for a long time, like like our, like our, our medical director, who's a MAPS principal investigator, and you know his friends and colleagues over at MAPS and other people in the space, you know they've really trailblazed this, and so we, you know, keep an open line of communication and are really thoughtful about what we're saying and how we're saying it to make sure that we're doing everything not just in the best interest of Mindbloom's clients and clinicians, but also the cause. You know, like uh, some people ask me like competitors and like uh, competitors, like I've wanted this to exist in the world for a decade since I experienced it. Like anyone who's helping to bring this to the world and bring this to others is a compatriot and ally. Um, so we try to, you know, be plugged into what everyone else is doing. But I mean, there's like a new psychedelic conference every like week now, right? Mm -hmm. And we don't go. We are just focused on clinicians and clients. Um, and I think maybe once we start having um, some really great outcomes data and things to share, um, then we are excited to share that with the community and do our part to help spread what we've learned to other people. Um, but right now, I mean, it is still pretty early and you know, we've only facilitated a few hundred sessions. Um, and so it's just laser focus on how to help people. Is ketamine for your business, like the wedge. And then as the legal framework changes in, you know, as it pertains to other medicines and substances like LSD and MDMA, that you ultimately can provide services based on those medicines? Yeah. I mean, we don't, I don't think about Mind Bloom as a psychedelic medicine company, first and foremost. I think about Mind Bloom as a cutting edge, next generation mental health and well being platform. 
It's delivering always science-backed treatments. So we'll never do anything that's not backed by like 100% science and literature um, in both beautifully inspired design spaces and online. Uh, so we're starting with ketamine therapy, not just because it's a psychedelic, but because it's just like the most effective, impactful, powerful medicine that's available today that people don't have access to. It just and, so happens to be a psychedelic, basically. Yeah, I mean, I, like I said, psychedelics been a massive part of my life for 10 years, and we're really excited by the incredible work that uh, you know, our medical director, Casey, and the team at MAPS are doing to get MDMA across the finish line and available to people in you know, a, a medical setting, uh, and the incredible work that's been done with psilocybin, and now a bunch of other companies who are leading clinical trials um, but I don't think psychedelic medicine will be the only treatments that we're providing. Uh, anything to help people with their, you know, overall mental health care and well-being is on the table for us. Um, so, I mean, where I'd like to see Mind Bloom go is, you know, helping a billion people achieve breakthroughs um, that fundamentally transform their lives so that they can be better people for themselves and better people for their communities and better humans for the world. Um, where I see the space going is. In psychedelics specifically, I really think it just comes down to um, how do people create the best experiences that help people get the most out of their treatments. Uh, and so I think it's going to be ubiquitous very, very quickly because, as you said, these medicines work. Like, we didn't invent ketamine. <laughs> like, we didn't invent psychedelic medicine. Um, we're just helping to um, build a platform that helps these clinicians increase access to treatment and help people get the most out of them. All right, Dylan. Well, thank you for joining this episode, and I look forward to seeing you guys grow. Thank you, Greg. This was a blast. Thanks for having me on. This is Business Trip, a podcast about psychedelic entrepreneurship. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed our chat with Dylan from Mindbloom. You can find out more about Mindbloom by visiting their website at mindbloom.co or on our website at businesstrip.fm. If you liked this episode of Business Trip, you can help us by subscribing to the podcast and leaving us a comment. We've got more episodes coming out soon covering the most promising businesses and leaders in psychedelics. Venture capital is going to be much more accessible to the psychedelics industry than it was for the cannabis industry. And that's just largely driven by the regulatory environment in which this is happening. And if you're building an interesting company in psychedelics, send me an email at greg at businesstrip.fm. I'm your host, Greg Kubin. Matthias Sarabrinsky and I are the executive producers. Editorial production and engineering came from Jonathan Davis. Our theme music is by Dorian Love. And that ethereal track you heard during the ketamine session is called Happiness Frequency by Conscious Sounds 432 Hertz. <laughs>